Democracy, Autocracy and Nationality, episode 17, The Patriotic War of 1812, Russia Confronts the French Revolution, or perhaps more accurately, Russia conf uh, confronts its own history of Frenchification, Westernization, as detailed in the previous lecture on Russian history. Russia has undergone a rapid transformation on the surface, the most physical embodiment of this, of course, being the construction of St. Petersburg as the new capital, the literal window on the West, giving Russia not only access to the Baltic and with that the maritime system of international trade, but also access to new ideas, importation of foreigners, even foreign dynasts into the Russian political system. Most people are going to be aware of this period of history, the early 19th century in Russian history, through Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. And effectively, this period could be summed up in the character of Pierre Bezukhov. It's schizophrenic. On the one hand, you could say it's Russia's painful departure from its flirtation with liberalism towards what is going to be the basis of Russia in the 19th century, orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality. Um, but in many ways, this period is mired in contradictions, very confusing contradictions, which are very difficult to follow. And nothing could summarize this contradiction best than the two rulers during this time, uh, Tsar Paul and Tsar Alexander I, both are incredibly strange and prone to their own dramatic U-turns throughout their brief reign in the case of Paul and longer reign in the case of Alexander. But why is this the situation? Well, if anyone is familiar with the original War and Peace, not the English translation, not only is it most of the work is in Russian, in fact, it becomes increasingly Russian as you read into it, but most of it from the dialogue point of view is written in French. Now, this summarizes something that is very interesting in terms of the Russian aristocratic elite during this time, in that the court and higher society, higher Russian aristocracy spoke French. Invariably, if you look at many of the names during this period, they seem German. Indeed, Catherine the Great was originally Sophia of Anhalt-Zerbst. Not only was she not Russian, she bore no genetic sort of link at all, apart from a very distant link to um, Peter III through his German ancestry. Uh, she was entirely German and adopted Russia as her cause. Indeed, before Catherine the Great, you have the period of the Bidon of China, the domination of Courland, which was a Baltic German state, that and other Russian, German, Livonians, Baltic Germans, and then people like von Benigsen, who have come over from Hanover, and many Germans serving in the Russian army. So you have a French-dominated language at court, but you also have the domination of French ideas. And this westernization is a deliberate policy of Catherine the Great and her inculcation of an enlightenment sense of virtue. This isn't unique to Russia either. This is very much um, consistent throughout all of the courts of Europe who have adopted French as the language of letters and the language of diplomacy. But perhaps the contrast between the French speaking German elite dominating the cities of St. Petersburg and to a lesser extent Moscow contrasts greatly with the overall situation that we see in Russia during this time. There are also literal German settlements in the form of the importation of German manufacturers who become the Volga Germans. As for the basis of this conversation, there are many recurring themes that are going to crop up. I'm going to make some references to 1612 and the original occupation of Moscow, this time by Polish forces. And in terms of Russia's own historical psyche, Poland and France bear considerable mention throughout this conversation. One of the last great legacies of Catherine the Great was the partition of Poland. That is how Russia gained most of its territory in the latter part of the 19th century. <laughs> and if you look at this map, first of all, Russia controlled Poland through the organization known as the Permanent Betrayed in Poland, the group of Polish aristocrats under the direction of the Russian ambassador. But increasingly, Poland became enamored in the patriotic party and 
revolution, revolutionaries who were inspired by the French Revolution that had taken place in 1789. And so increasingly from 1792 until 1795, Austria, Prussia and Russia dismembered what was the remains of Poland and Lithuania. And so gradually we see seeping into the Russian political psyche elements of the more you can consider reactionary politics, which are going to be pivotal for the remainder of Russia in the 19th century. So with the annexation of Belarusian, Ukrainian and Polish territory, we see the rise of pan-Slavism. Also at the same time, Catherine the Great is famed for her conquest of Ottoman territories in Crimea and Bessarabia, the creation of Novorossiya, which would again be part of this partial Germanification, but also colonization by Russians, Ukrainians, and even Serbs. There's a general trend toward empire building in the late reign of Catherine the Great, but also Catherine the Great, again, embodies many of these schizophrenic elements of Russian history, which I'm alluding to. Um, on the one hand, she makes a conscious alliance with the nobility, and the noble relationship with the Tsar is going to be a crucial factor, especially in the reign of Emperor Paul. Um, she's renowned for her great charter of the nobility, which undid many of the reforms of Peter the Great, who had taken the nobility to task and tried to force them into the rank of a service nobility. Instead, she basically made them self-governing and afforded them rights, privileges, their own genealogy books, their freedom to travel, etc., etc., and, of course, exemption from taxation. However, from 1793, we see the execution of Louis XVI in France. And as this very much bears mention in terms of Catherine the Great's own obsession with French Enlightenment ideas and her correspondence, most famously with Voltaire, who had bestowed upon Catherine the title of the Great. It is interesting that after 1793, Catherine the Great becomes, you could say, of all the monarchs, perhaps the most paranoid and distrustful of her previous infatuation with Enlightenment ideals, now that she considers that they have borne fruit in the French Revolution and resulted in the death of her co-dynast, although ostensible rival. And this is again bringing up the French-Polish connection. The French-Polish connection begins all the way in the 1770s with the Confederation of Bar, where Poland was propped up unsuccessfully by the French against the Russians. Again, we see Polish revolutions in the 1790s inspired by their connection with France. After the dissolution of the Polish state in 1795, uh, Polish lancers go off and join the ranks of the French Revolutionary Army and later Napoleonic Army. So in the mind of the Russians, the Polish problem and the French problem are very closely related. Catherine the Great in particular is concerned with the rise of masonry towards the end of her life. Nevertheless, she has a bigger crisis to face towards the end of her reign, in addition to this conservative turn, which is the issue of the succession and her own legacy compared to that of her son, Paul. Now, Paul is a very strange, interesting character, another anomaly in Russian history, perhaps the only one, again, bearing mention is his own father, Peter III. And as part of the ongoing struggle between father and son, father and sorry, uh, mother and son, uh, Catherine the Great, of course, had no claim to rule Russia in her own right. The only claim she had was as the mother of the Prince Paul by her husband, the Tsar Peter III. As this um, issue became um, worse and worse, uh, as he approached his majority, the Emperor Paul in 1772, Catherine spread rumors of him possibly being the bastard son of one of her many lovers, in this case, uh, uh, Prince Soltikov. Uh, nevertheless, it was pretty obvious that as Paul aged, he adopted many of the mannerisms of his father, including his obsession with military etiquette and parades. In order to try and distract the would-be Emperor Paul, um, the Empress Catherine married him off to Wilhelmina of Hesse-Darmstadt and even invited him into participation in government with her own privy chamber. And this is again is an unusual mark in Russian history which corresponds to both the reign of Alexander and Paul in the fact that he has a favourite at this point, one Razumovsky, who in all likelihood has an affair with the would be Empress Wilhelmina of Hesse Darmstadt, but she doesn't suffer any repercussions because she dies um, during the birth of her would be first son, who dies in who dies in childbirth along with the mother. 
There is a second marriage with Sophia Dorotea Wurttemberg, and this is a very successful marriage. It produces 10 children, two of whom, Alexander and Nicholas, become later czars and come to dominate Russian politics throughout the 19th century. And in 1771, we have the birth of the would-be czar Alexander I. It's interesting, however, that like with Paul, Alexander was taken away from his father and raised by his grandmother and very much groomed to replace Catherine the Great in the event of her death. It wasn't um, enough for her to depose her own son, but she was now intent on bypassing him in the line of succession um, due to his increasingly possibly well-founded hostility of his mother and everything that his mother stood for. There are many aspects which, I mean, someone in the chat is mentioning that uh, Pavel was an oddball. Well, <laughs> there is an element of that which is certainly true. One thing which makes Paul unique <coughs> among Russian czars is his fascination with the Knights Hospitaller, who were operating out of Malta at this time. And they had famously defended Malta against the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. <coughs> um, his obsession with Malta would form many of the, not only aesthetics, aesthetic, but uh, political um, implications behind Paul's reign, which is all the more fascinating. He was encouraged to leave Russia in 1781 and 82, and it's during this time that he made a reputation throughout Europe as the Russian equivalent of Hamlet, that of course being the aggrieved son trying to uh, uh, achieve um, retribution after the murder of his father. The height of this is the creation of the rival court, the Palace at Kachina. And here was his own sort of Prussian paradise, again, very much based after the model of Peter III, who famously, after the miracle of Brandenburg, the end of the hostilities between Russia and Prussia in 1762, forced the Russians to come back and wear Prussian dress. Well, here, Paul was able to achieve his own little Prussian statelet within Russia while still under the domination of his mother. And here he has many ideas on military theory and he writes his own military dissertation, The Reflections. And here we see many elements which are, you can say, consistent with the conflict in later Russian politics, which is the idea of expansionism and again, the possible propagation of border conflicts, expansion into colonial eras, expansion into Europe, uh, Russia's own fascination with Poland and Russian isolationism and rejection of everything that's coming out of the West. Um, nevertheless, Paul's own sort of political credibility was in free fall at this time because we have the Pugachev Rebellion. And one of the weird tangents of the Pugachev Rebellion was that Pugachev at one point claimed to be the would be assassinated Tsar Peter III. And in such a case, due to the own dynastic implications of that, Paul was further away ostracized from holding any real power. It's during this time around 1787 that Alexander was secretly arranged to inherit the Russian throne against Paul. <coughs> <coughs> and again, it's here interesting again that this was actually opposed by Alexander and Alexander's own mother, Paul's, um, Paul's wife. This was very much on the initiative of Catherine. And to this extent, Catherine wanted to raise Alexander and his brother Constantine along her own ideas of liberalism and the French, what would, would be the French Enlightenment. Um, indeed, he was tutored by the Swiss revolutionary Alexander uh, Frédéric César de la Harpe, who had later not only become a Swiss revolutionary, but the director of the Helvetic Republic. To this end, de la Harpe, who of course was a Republican and an avowed liberal, educated the future Alexander in the vein, Alexander I, in the vein of the French philosophes or the broader European luminaries from the English Locke and the Scottish Hume to the French Voltaire, Diderot, and of course, Rousseau. In this sense, Alexander had far more familiarity with European culture and French Enlightenment culture than he did with even Christian civilization or let alone Russian civilization. Again, we see this reflected to some extent in Leo Tolstoy and War and Peace. When Catherine finally dies in 1796, um, as a result of a stroke, Paul's first measure is to find, while Catherine is incapacitated and will die, uh, find Catherine's will, take power, and establish the Pauline laws of succession. <coughs> 
if anything, this is his most enduring legacy, because Russia of the 18th century was dominated by powerful women. We have Empress Catherine, Empress Elizabeth, Empress Anna, and of course, Empress Catherine II, Catherine the Great. The effect of the Pauline laws of succession inaugurated by Paul, hence Pauline, was the eradication of any female successor. This even plagues the Romanov succession to this day, if you pay attention to Romanov politics post-1992. Um, thereafter, all the heads of state of the Russian Empire, all the Tsars, were Tsars. They were male emperors, as opposed to the domination of, fe of female rulers, uh, empress regnants during the 18th century. Acting on the policy of isolationism elucidated in the reflections, one of Paul's first, first acts as emperor was to recall what was to be a very successful uh, Persian expedition, which had already taken the city of Durban to Dagestan and was moved on to take Tehran and dethrone the Qajar dynasty, led by one Valerian Zubov. This expedition was hastily ended by Paul, who wanted to adopt this isolationist foreign policy. And it should be noted that Valerian's older brother would later be a key member of the assassination party of Paul uh, four years later. Aware of rumours of his illegitimacy and the Saltykov connection that were consciously brought up by Catherine the Great again to discredit um, her son, um, Paul made a very conscious effort to associate himself with Peter III and indeed with Peter the Great. Paul transferred the remains of his father, Peter III, to the Peter and Paul Cathedral alongside the other Romanovs, um, while Alexei Orlov, the famous head of the uh, Preobrazhensky Regiment and a famous lover and count of the Russian Empire, a famous lover of Catherine the Great, um, and in all likelihood the assassin of Peter III, acting on his own initiative um, or possibly under orders of Catherine, um, murdering Peter III, was forced to march in the former Tsar's uh, funeral cortege. The new Tsar, Paul, went so far as to perform a posthumous coronation of his father, who reigned for such a short period of time that he never formally had his coronation. The corpse of Grigory Potemkin, the, pos the, po the morganatic um, husband of Catherine the Great and longtime lover, and essentially the creator of Novorossiya, was exhumed and his body was desecrated on the orders of Paul. Ascending to the throne, as Paul did amid the French Revolutionary Wars, uh, Paul's policy combined anti-Jacobinism with a vindictiveness directed at his mother's legacy. To this end, he was prepared to release Enlightenment critics to the left of Catherine, such as uh, Nikolai Novikov. In line with Paul's veneration for the Knights of Malta, Paul envisaged a fundamental reform of what he considered to be the decadent and corrupted Russian nobility into a Prussian-style service nobility that went further to synthesize elements of medieval European chivalry. Paul's favorites during this time are recurring figures during the saga, Rostopochin, Arkacheyev, and Kutuzov. Otherwise, Paul removed over 300 generals and seven marshals who he found lacking compared to his new sense of medieval chivalry and virtue. Paul alienated many in the army with what were considered excessive punishments for minor misdemeanors as part of his military reforms. Indeed, the watch parade was a central component in the life of the Tsar, his soldiers dressed in impeccable Prussian uniforms, performing complex and taxing maneuvers. Paul's infantry code placed a keen emphasis on military aesthetics. One of the, you can say, eccentricities of Paul was his demanding of the Russian goose step and even demanding that soldiers' heads remain so straight that they had to march whilst balancing water on top of their heads and any sort of infractions or breaches in this elaborate system of the parade uh, were dealt with typically by flogging. And this extended even beyond the military, this extended towards young ladies who had to curtsy as the emperor passed by in his carriage, so much so that there was a rush to get away from the emperor whenever his carriage passed through the streets of St. Petersburg. Despite his isolationist foreign policy, Paul was opposed to the French Revolution and the expansion of France into Italy especially, after Napoleon had dissolved the um, Republic of Venice and potentially posed a threat to Russian interests in the Eastern Mediterranean. After Austria um, was forced to make peace with France at the Treaty of Campo Formio, all of a sudden all the great um, uh, 
members of the French émigré, um, the would-be King of France, uh, the Duc de Provence, who would later become the Louis XVIII, <coughs> and Louis de Condé, who had been a pivotal émigré um, French commander, um, instead took refuge in St. Petersburg as Paul um, styled himself as the chief opponent of Jacobinism and really the only true opponent to Napoleon now that both Prussia and Austria had made peace with him. After the fall of Naples, the French supported uprisings in Switzerland, Rome and Naples. And if you recall from my previous lecture on exporting the French Revolution, Russian and British troops played a significant role in restoring the King Ferdinand IV to his throne in Naples from Sicily. In 1798, Napoleon um, betrayed and took the island of Malta on his way to invading Egypt. And already at this time, Paul had, as, as I mentioned, demonstrated a intense interest in the uh, order of the Nice Hospitaller in Malta. And so much so that when we have the partitions of Poland, uh, it being a Catholic order, the Nice Hospitaller, with priories spread all across Europe, many priories now found themselves in Russian territory in the former Catholic, Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, rather than penalize these Catholic orders, the Orthodox Paul invited them to relocate to St. Petersburg. And in response, the Knights made Paul a protector of the Nice Hospitaller. After Napoleon seized Malta, Paul was elected as its new Grand Master, and the defense of the orders um, priories throughout Europe um, became Paul's personal pretext to join in the Second Coalition against France, one of its most enthusiastic members. Despite um, Alexei Suvorov's, he was the most famous generalissimo of the French armies at this time, who had won many French victories, against, uh, sorry, Russian victories against the Ottoman Empire in the preceding decades. Um, despite Suvorov's hatred and opposition to the military reforms of Paul, Suvorov was placed at the head of a Russian expeditionary force, uh, the first such anti-French revolutionary expeditionary force from Russia, to join in with the Austrians and give uh, deliver a string of defeats against the against the French in Italy while Napoleon was otherwise engaged in the Middle East. Despite um, and again uh, being the head of the coalition forces as well, so the prestige of Suvorov actually far, ex um, far excelled the number of Russians that were part of this expeditionary force. Despite Suvorov's victories in Italy, Paul um, and Austria debated the fate of Italy with the former uh, Paul favoring a pure restoration of all of the princes as they existed before 1796 when Napoleon began his great grand expedition. Whilst Austria began to favor a new Italian settlement to the benefit of Austria, including the annexation of Venice and the re-annexation of Milan. Um, as this conflicted with Paul's, you can say, more reactionary ideas of a pure restoration based on eliminating any sort of last refuge of the conquest of um, Italy by France during the period from 1796 to 1799, Suvorov was recalled, detached from the coalition forces and made to join with the remainder of the Russian army, which was dealing with the situation in Switzerland, which had been again forced into um, French remit and created as the Helvetic Republic. But here, the Russians were briefly divided, abandoned by their Austrian forces, and um, uh, Suvorov wasn't personally defeated, but the other army in Switzerland was defeated. Believing that the Austrians had betrayed Russia, Paul gravitated towards the British, whom he believed had no territorial ambitions and therefore no conflict of interest with Paul's own designs of a pure anti-French restoration. A Russo-English invasion of the Netherlands, however, ended in disaster. Meanwhile, at the Battle of Marengo, Napoleon had effectively undone all of Suvorov's gains in Italy, and now Suvorov was dead. The coalition would go on to be defeated, the Austrians primarily, at the Battle of Hohenlinden by Moreau. British actions then against Denmark, and pivotally the British conquest of Malta, and failure to restore the island to the order of the Knights Hospitaller, caused Paul to make a dramatic about turn, abandoning the coalition, and forming a hostile coalition of Scandinavian powers against Britain. The coup of Brumaire in France, whereby Napoleon gained power and then performed his own self-coup against uh, Roger Ducot and uh, Sieres, and therefore established his own personal dictatorship in the form of the consulate, ironically made the new situation in France more amenable to Paul's own conservative and reactionary impulses. 
and thus, if anything, cemented his hostility against the British. British vessels in the Baltic were seized, and British traders were imprisoned throughout Russia. Admiral Nelson acted quickly, defeating the Danish and then directing the Royal Navy towards St. Petersburg, while the British uh, negotiated treaties with Persia in anticipation of a Russian Cossack expedition to India. Paul was at once the most reactionary of Europe's monarchs, and now ironically, one of Napoleon's greatest assets. Paul ended noble exemptions from tax and corporal punishment and purged the palace bureaucracy to such an extent, given how they were all starved with people from Catherine's reign, his mother's reign, that the entire system of the Russian bureaucracy actually began to, began to lag. In particular, uh, Paul was concerned with ending Russia's endemic problem with corruption and attempted to undermine the nobility further by direct, directly intervening on the path of serfs against the Russian nobility. Moreover, the court had been forced to move to Paul's new Mikhailovsky castle while still under construction. Uh, Mikhailovsky castle uh, was his own sort of, uh, you can say, resort, his own medieval castle resort inspired by his fascination with the Order of the Knights of Malta. And the removal of the Russian nobility to Mikhailovsky was, again, one of many insults in terms of having to remain around the emperor and indulge in part of this elaborate new military choreography which was resented by you can argue the more corrupt and lazy russian officers that didn't want to entertain this on part of the emperor paul had at once alienated the larger part of the russian nobility who found willing support from britain in the form of charles whitworth the british ambassador in 1801, a, a conspiracy formed to force paul to abdicate led by one count panin the nephew of paul's former tutor Paul was confronted by a drunk party of would-be assassins. And again, they were there to compel his abdication. He resisted only to be struck with a snuff box and strangled by one Nikolai Zubov, the older brother of the aforementioned Valerian Zubov. And among the party was also Platon Zubov, uh, Catherine the Great's youngest and final lover. While Alexander was not party, and the would-be Zarevich Alexander was not party to the conspiracy to murder his father, he chose not to punish the conspirators. Indeed, Levin von Benigsen, one of the key conspirators, would become one of Alexander's leading commanders. Alexander's passivity during the conspiracy and de facto acquiescence in the role of his father's death affected him for the rest of his life. Indeed, whilst members of the assassination party were effectively promoted as a result of the assassination of Paul, uh, Rostopochin, who had been the chief minister of state towards the end of Paul's reign and had been responsible for the dramatic diplomatic about turn in Paul's foreign policy, was removed and politically isolated for the next eight years. After a brief moment where it appeared that the Empress Maria, uh, the widow of Tsar Paul, would assume power in place of a reluctant Alexander, Alexander at 23 became Tsar and took Louis, uh, Louise of Baden as his wife. Thereafter, all Tsars would be male. Alexander declared that he would rule as Catherine the Great did, though he didn't want to rule and was in some instance hostile to the legacy of both his father and indeed of his grandmother Catherine. Alexander at first appeared to be the most liberal of all of Russia's Tsars. He introduced liberal constitutional reforms and anti-serf reforms. His first instrument of rule was the Privy Committee, a close-knit circle of Alexander's liberal favorites. Conservatives from the reign of Paul were removed from power and replaced by Viktor Kopche, uh, Pavel Stoganov, uh, Mikhail Speransky, and Adam Zatoysky, a Polish liberal and noble and later bitter opponent of Alexander's brother Nicholas I. The system of government created by Peter the Great with its collegia and its increasingly overlapping authorities was replaced by a new cabinet system with clearly defined ministries responsible to the Tsar. A state council would ultimately be created, clearly inspired by the, const by the constitution of the French consulate, through the direct influence of de la Harpe, returning as a director of the Helvetic Republic, remember Alexander's tutor, to serve as both executive and legislature. It had never evolved into a legislative house equivalent to that of a Duma, a Zemsky Sorbo, or Parliament. <coughs> The Tsar also aimed at a codification of the Russian legal system, though this was never achieved. 
small numbers of serfs were given the right to purchase their freedom and attain the status of free agriculturalists, though as this could only be achieved with the permission of their serf masters, barely any became free agriculturalists. Reforms were conducted on a small scale in Russian Livonia, where serfs at once became villeins, effectively a villein is a serf but with more rights, and then would achieve freedom, though this system was not extended to the rest of Russia. It is possible that were it not for Russia's, uh, Russia's conflict with revolutionary France, Alexander would have seen reforms on the scale of, or perhaps beyond that, of his grand nephew Alexander II, the great Tsar Emancipator. Alexander's original liberal zeal that characterizes early reign gave credence to the notion that he was a Jacobin autocrat, a term that I have used to describe Napoleon Bonaparte, though Alexander possessed a diplomatic nuance and impenetrability that distinguished him utterly from his French counterpart. The irony being that um, La Harpe, an avowed Republican, through the reflections on the true nature of the Consul for Life, obviously a reflection on Napoleon, influenced Alexander's own cooling temperament towards Bonaparte as his power evolved from consular head of state to dictator for life and then emperor. Ironically, as Bonaparte became ostensibly more conservative and detached from Republican ideals, the Tsar was at once repulsed as a liberal um, infatuate and at the same time, when Bonaparte was responsible for the execution of the Duc d'Angers, the son of Louis de Condé, um, Napoleon cast himself as a dynastic threat to the European nobility. So he was offended as a liberal, and he was also offended as the Tsar of Russia. Having remained at peace with France and even facilitated French interests in the mediations that remade the Holy Roman Empire before its ultimate dissolution. Uh, to this point, again, it should be seen that Alexander was not above meddling in the affairs of uh, European politics. He was more than willing to meddle in the affairs of the Holy Roman Empire if it benefited his then ally Prussia or his would-be German relatives. And to this extent, you could say Alexander is one of the key figures along with Talleyrand, who is responsible for the first death of the Holy Roman Empire in 1803 before its final death in 1806. Similar to, however, when we have the assassination, the execution of the Duc d'Angers, we see a change in Alexander similar to that of Catherine the Great after 1793 with the execution of Louis XVI. Alexander casts himself in the role of the defender of European peace often employing the liberal language of defender of the rights of humanity in opposition to the tyranny of Napoleon Bonaparte. And this would later lead to Metternich own criticism that Alex, as Alexander threw himself with so much zeal and ideological fervor into all of his acclamations regarding his foreign policy, Metternich would construe Alexander as a madman with a gentle and somewhat dishonest temperament. To this end, Alexander accepted Britain's invitation to join forces of the Third Coalition against Napoleon. However, as you all know, and this is the beginning of war and peace, we have the disastrous campaign at Ulm, where the Russians failed to reinforce the Austrians. <coughs> and then Alexander himself is responsible for leading the Russian forces of the Battle of Austerlitz. Here, combined with the remnants of the Austrian army, Alexander believes that he will be able to win a decisive victory against the outnumbered Napoleon, and only finds himself having occupied the strategic heights of Pratzen to have fallen into a Napoleonic trap when the entire Russian army is caught by Napoleon's feigned retreat and later encirclement of much of the Russian forces. Even at one point, Alexander's life was threatened as the guard was able to arise through the mists and threaten the general staff and Alexander himself on the heights of the Pratzen. After this, I think it's important to understand that Alexander was self-aware enough that he wouldn't ever take personal military command of any future situation. He believed here he could possibly gain the prestige of having defeated Napoleon. But here again, what we see with the death of his father, it severely affects him and changes him and makes him a far more cautious and uh, you can say less bellicose figure and one who's prepared to allow his generals to come forth and uh, assume direct control of the army. Um, someone in the chat is saying that the uh, kidnapping execution of the Duc d'Angers was a dumb move by Napoleon. 
Yes, it was in the sense that it helped kick off the war of the Third Coalition, which ultimately benefited Napoleon. No, in the sense that Napoleon needed it in order to become Emperor of France. At once, he needed to be a Jacobin, not just a dynast, so it wouldn't be seen as a matter of pure ambition. He had to present himself, as ironically as this sound, as a revolutionary and emperor, so I believe it was essential for him. Thereafter, remember, the, um, we have the Prussian alliance with Austria, with uh, Russia, and the Prussians, believing that they have Russian support after the Treaty of Pressburg and Napoleon's reorganization of uh, Germany into the Confederation of the Rhine and humiliation of Austria, Prussia declares war on France. However, because of Russia's slow mobilization and willingness to support its ally, Prussia is alone when it uh, faces Napoleon and de Vaux at the battles of Jena and Eurstedt, respectively. Um, the French defeat the Prussians in both instances. And thereafter, Napoleon marches from Berlin, where he creates the continental system, his system of economic warfare against Great Britain, who will remain at war with France throughout this entire time. And he marches into Poland. During his arrival in Poland, Poland, which of course had been partitioned and the state of Poland had been dissolved in 1795, the Prussian-Polish um, aristocrats revolt against Prussian rule and eagerly support the French. Um, the Russians move into Poland, Napoleon marches and meets uh, von Bennigsen at the Battle of Ilau, Napoleon's first sort of major check. And it's during this time that there are many associations made with Russia and the campaign of 1612 at the height of the Troubles. Of course, 1612 is when Moscow was occupied by the forces of Poland and Lithuania. And there were often these appeals to the heroic figures responsible for the liberation of Moscow, Kuzma Minin and uh, Pozharski. <coughs> Interestingly enough, these associations emerge way before the actual invasion of Russia and the Patriotic War of 1812. Hardliners like Rostopodchin uh, wanted to go further than these vague um, appeals to uh, Russia's sort of xenophobia towards Poland and by association France. Um, Rostopodchin demanded that all Frenchmen be ex expelled from Russia. And here we sense this notion that the Russians want to russify themselves away from this foreign influence, which is seen as, at this point, um, con contrary to Russia's interests, as Russia finds herself in complete opposition with the forces of the revolution and the nation of France. Though disinterested in religion up until now, we here begin to see that Alexander entertains his first, you can say, pragmatic or political usage of religious language before we see a later, you can argue, far more sincere form of personal conversion after 1812. Um, and here he uses the language of um, uh, Mother Russia and the defense of the fatherland as the French advance through Poland and enter into East Prussia. The first victim of this anti-Polish zeal sweeping Russia was Alexander's chief minister, friend and confidant, Adam uh, Zatoyski. Zatoyski was at once an opponent of Bonaparte, in line with the Tsar's view that since the execution of the Duke of Angers, um, Bonaparte was a regicide. And yet he was also a supporter, as a Pole and a noble, of a new Polish state. To achieve this seemingly contradictory foreign policy, in opposition to Russia's coalition partner Austria, and up until then neutral ally Prussia, the entire map of Europe would have to be redrawn to compensate Russia's allies to create a Poland under Russian protection, and ostensibly under him, Zatoyski, as king. In contrast to the Tsar, who was at once ambivalent while his chief minister was planning a territorial revolution in Europe. And again, this constant contradictions between the Tsar and his more liberal ministers is a consistent aspect of Alexander's reign. The position of Zatoyski had become diplomatically and domestically untenable as he had become detested by both the anti-Polish party of Russians and the Prussian allies. Though Zatoyski remained a private friend and even rumored lover of the Empress Louise of Baden, again a strange um, uh, carryover from history when we look at um, the fate of Paul's first wife. The leading denouncer of Zartoski was one A.S. Uh, Shishkov, a Russian patriotic writer who accused Zartoski of using Russia to attain for himself a Polish crown. The Russian army under Bennigsen was decisively defeated at the Battle of Freeland, and it's here that Napoleon was prepared to offer Russia generous terms, in contrast to what would be his treatment of Prussia. And I have here a segment by uh, 
Andre Zorin by Fables Alone, Literature and State Ideology in late 18th century and early 19th century Russia, which um, uh, sheds light on many of the ideological aspects of Russian history, conceptual aspects of Russian history, which are going on during this time. I have a couple of segments which I'm going to read with him, so bear with me. The Second War with Napoleon of 1806 to 1807 strongly energized the national conservative opposition. Its ideologue sensed that the national mobilization created favorable possibilities for going on the political attack. It was just at this time that the reg uh, regular literary readings began at uh, Shishkov's and uh, Dejavin's. These meetings would, a few years later, develop into the colloquy of lovers of the Russian word. The works written during these months by Winter uh, by the writers of the circle present an entire range of ideological metaphors in which to build a new mythology of the origins of Russian statehood, to find historical analogies for current events, and to rearrange the, the, the figures in the historical national pantheon. By 1807, the contours of the new state ideology were basically defined. Even evidently, the emperor himself was thinking over the prospects for allying with these former intellectual foes. In de Jarvin's memoirs, it says in 1806 and the beginning of 1807, at the time when the French went into Prussia, he wrote to the emperor, two notes about the measures to subdue the impotence of the French and to defend Russia from an attack by Bonaparte, about which he spoke to him in person asking permission to compose a project for which he had already collected his thoughts and sketched out a plan. It only needed some corrections from the War College and other places concerning the troops, dress, the fortresses, weapons, and some other things. The Sovereign accepted this proposal with favour, wanted to summon him to meet, but having gone in March to the army near Friedland and then returning from there, he changed his former gracious behaviour and no longer greeted and did not speak to him. We should not doubt that it was respect with the poet's um, aging poet's gifts as a commander that caused um, Alexander to demonstrate his previous favour to Javajan, whom three years later he had scandalously fired from service. However, the developments of events, uh, the development of events, brought to Javajan, Shishkok, and their adherents bitter disillusionment. As was stated in the political journal in the year of 1807, from the Sarmatian lands, and again this is a common reference we see, Sarmatia, to Poland throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries, the association with the Polish state and the ancient Sarmatians of classical antiquity. From the Sarmatian lands irrigated with floods, uh, with floods of blood, sprouted an olive tree of friendship, which quickly rising embraced France and Russia with its branches. Instead of the purging of the foreign scum and a battle to the death, there followed the Tilsit peace, Speransky's rise, and a new round of reformist activism. Napoleon's appreciation of Russia was on the basis that France and Russia were geographic allies without territorial designs on the other, supposedly. On meeting Napoleon, the Tsar declared his hatred of England and Napoleon replied, in that case, sire, we have made peace. On an artificial island in the river Niemann, the Tsar and the emperor talked for hours over possible territorial designs, making themselves the emperors of the East and the West. While Napoleon would dominate continental Europe, Russia would be given a free hand in Romania and Finland, with a renewed possibility of an invasion of British India and even the occupation of Constantinople and the Straits of the Dardanelles. Russia would join the continental system against England, even engaging in a low-key war against England from 1807 to 1812. Such a dramatic diplomatic turn had already been committed by Tsar Paul in 1800. Though Alexander had been forced into this position unwillingly, therefore abandoning the defense of his ally Prussia, who was dismembered, and from whose territory a new Polish state, the Duchy of Warsaw, was created, which would later be seen to be totally antithetical to Russian interests in the short and long term. The period after the signing of Tilsit is synonymous with the rise of the favorite Mikhail Speransky, a purported Bonapartist, and after 1811 accused of being a Freemason, loathed by the court, conservatives, and the Empress Dowager. And this is Zorin on the topic of masonry in, Fra uh, masonry in Russia and of Speransky in general. In the Russian interpretation, anti-Masonic mythology almost immediately emerged with traditional ideas about secret conspiracies against Russia that were spun beyond its borders. And of course, these secret conspiracies go back to the founding of the idea of the Third Rome, the fact that the Third Rome is the embodiment of a Christian civilization, 
which has been able to endure, you can say, the <coughs> corruption and betrayal that Byzantium endured with the union of the churches, whereby the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church nominally became the same church. Moscow was spared this, and after the betrayal of um, Byzantium, which was later repaid by the second conquest of it by the Turks, Moscow became the only unsullied defender of orthodoxy, the third Rome and the final Rome, and thereby the legacy of Moscow and the endurance of Moscow is fundamental to the conception of Russian orthodoxy and Christianity itself. Almost from the advent of Masonic lodges, a significant number of texts appeared in which Masons were depicted on the one hand as Satan's servants and on the other as incorrigible Francophiles who followed the prescriptions of a hostile France. One of the poems that reflected these notions, the anonymous psalm exposing the Freemasons, was even included in Kergamon's letter writing manual, thus testifying to the popularity of this text and guaranteeing its broad dissemination. In the 1780s, most significant anti-Masonic polemics were the comedies and publicist works by Catherine II and Catherine the Great herself. These depicted Masons as charlatans and deceivers who ensnared unsuspecting citizens in their intrigues. But the ironic and scornful tone of the Empress's printed comments on the secret society only functioned to mask her profound anxiety over them. According to the stories of Metropolitan Platon, as recorded by Lobiansky after her return to Moscow from the Crimea in 1787, Catherine was apt to see omens of her funeral at the instigation of the Martinists. And of course, the Martinists are technically Masons, but they are a, another sect of um, uh, radicals and revolutionaries emanating out of France, which perhaps deserve their own stream. <coughs> Everywhere in the sand that was sprinkled on the streets and the dark grey of the streets, light poles and even in the body type of certain Muscovite clergymen. They will bury me here, she said to Platon. Your preacher must be a dark martinist. Look at him, skin and bones all dried out. At the moment, Catherine was worried about the connections between Moscow, Masons and Prussia, as well as their attempts to make compact with the heir to the throne, Paul, or in Russian, Pavel Petrovich. The Masons, whom the Empress did not distinguish from the Martinists, which she hated, again appeared simultaneously as sorcerers devoted to black magic and agents of foreign powers. In these years, Catherine was moving from polemics and restrictions to unqualified repression. At approximately the same time, there were, wi there were widespread rumours in Russian society that the Jacobins and Masons planned to poison the Empress. Much later, in Rospochin's notes on the Martinists, he wrote that the Martinists drew lots from who would stab the Empress to the lot that fell with Lepukin. For their part, the Masons did not dispute the reality of this conspiracy, but instead tried to emphasize their own innocence, referring to some unknown Illuminati as the perpetrators. The rebirth of Russian masonry in the first years of Alexander's reign inevitably stimulated the revival of the traditional phobias. Characteristically, fear of the Masonic menace grew especially strong in 1806 and 1807 during the conflict with France. It was just at this time that Russian versions of the two most well-known books in the worldwide conspiracy came out, two simultaneous editions of Barrowell and the paraphrase of Robinson. And again, maybe that's another talk for another time. At this time, the popular lodge, People of God or the New Israel, was closed and its founder, Tadosh Grabianka, a Polish count and follower of the radical Avignon system of masonry and the Catholic spirit, was arrested and locked away in the fortress. Several members of this lodge also suffered. A.F. Lab uh, Labsin's uh, journal, Messenger of Zion, was banned, and uh, Lianovsky was also exiled to Yaktusk in uh, Siberia for his translation of a mystical book, Longing for the Homeland. Stilling himself, who um, Stilling himself, who corresponded with Russian Masons during these years, also cautioned them against the great society of the enemy of our Lord and his kingdom, in which Voltaire was the first member. The main role in this evil society was played by Weishaupt and the Illuminati. Weishaupt is a famous Bavarian member of the Illuminati who uh, very clearly crops up in these um, circles from the elements of Rosicrucianism and masonry around the 1770s, who had as their universal goal a universal republic, the extermination of earthly rulers or enslaving of them by the Illuminati and the complete destruction of the Christian faith. Of course, in distinction from Barrowell, the Protestant Stilling did not see the Jesuits as the bulwark against the satanic criminal plotters, but the activities of the Henota sect, 
He believed that in apocalyptic terms, the Honotas were designed to acquire their promised land in Asiatic Salima, located in the Crimea, the Volga steppes, Astrakhan, and under the wing of the eagle, that is Alexander I, the emperor of Russia. Let us all pray together, Stilling wrote, and may the Lord preserve this great and good sovereign and those around him from Illuminism, which is especially strong today. Of the threshold, on the threshold of the coming war, the Committee for Preserving the General Safety was created in January of 1807. The first point of the secret regulations of the committee contained a very clear indication of the empire's main threat. The perfidious government of France, trying to achieve its ruinous goal of worldwide destruction and disorganization, among other things, as is well known, patronizes the remnants of secret societies throughout all lands under the name of Illuminati, Martinists, and other similar ones. And though this is secret collaboration, uh, collaborators in all European countries, not including those noxious people whom they openly send in support of the descend, who, in a collateral way, to speak to assist the French government, and by means of whom it succeeds brilliantly in its evil plans. The author of the regulations, and probably the initiator of the committee, was one of the young friends of the emperor, one Novelitsev. On March, of 50, on March 5th of the same year, 1807, he wrote Alexander, our chancellery is full of Martinists, Illuminati and scoundrels of all shades at home, team with French and Jacobins of all nations. However, the attack on the Masons did not go very far at this time, and only those who were connected with Grabianka's lodge were subjected to persecution. The anti-French direction of Russian foreign policy did not last long either. In June of 1807, the Tilsit Peace was signed. In the autumn of 1808, there followed the Erfurt meeting between Alexander and Napoleon, which firmly placed the Russian-French alliance at the centre of the new political alignment in Europe. It was after his return from Erfurt that Speransky became the emperor's confidant and right-hand man. The circumstances of Speransky's rise turned him into a kind of symbol of the unpopular pro-French policy. Rumours of the unprecedented praise that Napoleon had bestowed upon the new favourite, as well as his constant meetings with the French ambassador, de Coulancourt, did not work in his favour. When it became clear that it was Speransky who was the sole um, and prime mover of the far-reaching and poorly understood reforms of Alexander I, his image took on a clear cut and familiar contours in contemporary's eyes. In December 1809, Joseph de Maistre, the Savoyard ambassador to St. Petersburg, referring to well-informed people, reported to his king and the emperor's cabinet, um, fulfills the orders of the widespread sect which is trying to destroy monarchies. De Maistre did not name the leaders of this sect, but there was no need for this. In all the courts of Europe, everyone would have understood perfectly well whom he had in mind. In 1812, Speransky's subordinate in the commission to compile a new law code, Rosenkampf, accused him of treason of the state, um, treason to the state and Illuminatiism. At the same time, a denunciation sent Alexander and signed Count Rospochin um, and the Muscovites, but possibly coming out of the old free thinker Fyodor Kovacian, said that Speransky, under the guise of patriotism, wanted to act against the person of the emperor, to provoke all the states to anger and incite the people to pronounce a great and terrible demand. The author of the letter also claimed to know the place where Napoleon's correspondence with the exposed participants in the conspiracy is kept. In ascribing his own fantasies to Rostopochin, whose views were well known to the public, the author of the denunciation only partly sinned against the truth. By this time, Rostopochin had already sent Alexander his notes on the Martinists through the Grand Princess Ekaterina Pavlona, uh, the sister of Alexander, in which he listed those, in his opinion, who were active in secret societies. Furthermore, this number are all more or less devoted to Speransky, who, while not belonging to any sect in his heart, makes use of their services for conducting business and keeps them dependent on himself. Behind the back of Speransky, who was manipulating the Martinist, loomed an even more menacing figure. At the end of the memorandum, Rostopochin wrote, I am sure that Napoleon, who is directing everything towards the achievement of his goals, patronizes him. And at some point, he will find strong support in that society which is just as much worthy of scorn as it is dangerous. Then people will see, but too late, that their ideas are not chimeras, but reality. They do not mean to be the butt of ridicule, but to go down in history, and that this sect is nothing other than the hidden enemy of governments and states. In his project of reform, Speransky envisaged a constitutional system based on a series of what we would later know in Russian history as Dumas, 
the creation of possible cantonal assemblies or volost um, with their own elected dumas or districts, a system again that we see with the creation of Alexander II some 40, 50 years later. And the election of these local dumas throughout the remnants of the Russian Empire based on a new system of governments. As a mediating power between the autocrat and the Duma, we have the creation of the Council of State, the aforementioned um, State Council, um, which was based upon the plans which have been going along in Alexander's reform agenda since 1801 through to 1804, though the State Council was finally created in 1810. This council dominated the constitutional history of Russia throughout the 19th century. Indeed, Alexander is often, I believe, overlooked as one of the great constitutional instigators for the creation of the Russian state. And despite, of course, all of these having liberal and potentially Bonapartist inspirations uh, directly through the influence of uh, uh, Speransky and de la Harpe. And this would affect the state of the Russian Empire all the way up until the creation of the 1905 constitution, which was based again on the reforms which were conducted by Speransky. Indeed, when you look at the rhetoric of Alexander, even after 1812 and through to 1814, Alexander uses the rhetorics of the creations of constitutions, which, of course, de Maistre absolutely hated as a fundamental opponent of constitutions and giving his advice to members of the Russian court. Nevertheless, in accordance with Spransky's plan, Alexander was very keen to give a constitution to Poland when it was conquered by the Russians in 1808, and, of course, later to Poland, albeit that ended in absolute disaster, as anyone would with a knowledge of history of Poland in the 19th century would know. The catalyst for Speransky's fall was in the seeming realization of all of Russia's fears at once. Speransky's treason, the anti-Russian Masonic conspiracy, um, and of course Speransky's own inspiration for reform from the organizations of the Catholic Jesuits and again the Martinists, the Illuminati, and the Masons. Um, and this is best symbolized by his attempt to merge the education of the Masonic lodges with the Orthodox clergy in one of the most bizarre episodes in Russian history. And again, here I'm reading from Zorin. In the memoirs of Baron um, uh, Guanashild, Speransky's close colleague of those years, it tells of the plans to reform the clergy that inspired the state secretary of the extremely strange means by which he wanted to implement them. The proposal was to found a Masonic lodge with branches throughout the Russian Empire, where the most capable figures of all conditions would be required to join. Religious brothers would have to write articles on the well-known humanitarian questions, write sermon, and these papers would be taken to the main lodge so that the first master of the great lodge would review them. According to whose recommendations, the most worthy would receive promotion in the union of Masonic lodges and in the state. But since the many already existing lodges will by no means agree with the project and pursue completely different goals, Speransky offered two ukases or edicts for the emperor's signature. With one of them, the emperor ordered the Ministry of Popular Enlightenment, uh, the Minister, sorry, of Popular Enlightenment, Alexei um, Ros Rosomonsky, to temporarily close all lodges in the empire and to demand of their masters uh, the chair of their various rituals. The UCAS was signed by the emperor and was quickly carried out. The second ordered the heads of the lodges either to accept new rituals from the Sonic Lodges compiled by Speransky or to close them. The emperor promised to sign this UCAS, but this was not done. Although though I was only 25 at the time, I felt that this project was totally impractical and would have created an even more unfavorable impression that would have been too closely um, related to the project of Adam Weishaupt, the Bavarian Illuminati member. In these memoirs written many years after the fact, there are minor inaccuracies. Thus, the order of the Ministry of Police given to the leaders of the lodges did not involve the temporary closure, but only the temporary halt in accepting new members. However, on the whole, of um, Gowan Shield correctly described the course of events. The well-known Masonic reformer, I. Fesler, was invited to Russia to work out the new unified ritual, and Speransky obtained a position for him as Professor of Hebrew and Philosophy at the Alexander Nevsky Academy. The appointment was likely part of his plan to orient the future of lodges towards clergymen. The strategic goals that Speransky pursued in planning such a simultaneously secret and official lodge and their relation to his attempts to transform the clergy become comprehensible if we set them in the general context of his reform activities. It was just at this time that Speransky began a reform of the government administration on a colossal scale.
Naturally, he could not fail to consider the people who would be destined to take up responsibilities in this reform system. The aim of forming a cohort of educated government servitors of all ranks also dictated the UCAS on exams that were to accompany the elevation to the first noble ranks. And of course, this is there in mind with Peter's own table of ranks and that nobility was a, a ranking system to climb as a, um, based on service to the state as opposed to anything based on genealogy. It also created the Lycée, or again, the French system of education, as Zarskoy Solo, the Tsar's village, an elite educational institution where children of the high nobility were to be prepared for state service. But Speransky naturally saw the estate he came from himself as the main reserve for staffing the bureaucracy. It should be noted himself that Speransky wasn't even a noble. Speransky was the son of a lowly orthodox priest who himself wasn't orthodox, but neither was he a Mason. He was a Christian mystic who was inspired by all of these various elements, which you can say explains his incredibly heterodox views on the hierarchy of the church and his desire to build a new system of Russian bureaucracy, which is actually fundamentally dependent on Masonry, whilst at the same time, Speransky is not fully aware or appreciative of the implications of Masonry and the implications that has in the Russian mindset at that time. <laughs> the issue concerned a consistent system for the selection of the most talented representatives of the clergy, first of all students from religious educational institutions. The selected persons were to be connected to one another by the bonds of a mystical brotherhood united by a single centre under government supervision. In the words of the celebrated German statesman G.F. Stein, Speransky believed in the revival of the world by means of secret societies. In Gowenschild, Spransky's project too closely recalled that of the Illuminati. However, both Spransky and the mem memoirist himself took their understanding of the Illuminati's activities primarily from Barrel and similarly works of this kind. Moreover, as has been noted, Barrel's assertion that the Illuminati were delighted with the laws and practices of the Jesuits and they tried to imitate their methods, furthering diametrically opposite views. The organization that Spransky conceived with, a, with its official character and orientation towards the clergy appeared something of a midway between a traditional Masonic lodge and the order of the Jesuits. Joseph de Maestro, who suspected Spransky of fulfilling the commands of <coughs> the vast sect, wrote that he had publicly lauded the Jesuits and their system of education. <coughs> In spite of his presumptions, Spransky was probably completely sincere. He most likely valued the organizational practice, a pedagogical system of the Jesuits, and wanted to use elements of their experience for his own ends. Analogously, organizing practice, uh, organizing elements, uh, um, sorry, analogously, organizing a centralized Masonic lodge in Russia could, in his view, have averted the spread of Illuminatist tendencies. It seems that Speransky was not alone in the idea later in the diary of one uh, Bolivikovsky echoed rumours circulating in St. Petersburg that Prince Galitsyn, a favourite of Alexander, and the second Philoet, again, another allusion to an earlier moment in Russian history, when we talk about Tsar Michael and Philoet, would like to create a new Christian social order, the Soslovi, in opposition to the Masons. Be that as it may, the project, like others of Speransky's reformist plans, reflected the position of Alexander, who saw a definite danger in Masonic lodges and wanted either to place them under unconditional state control or to counter their influences <coughs> by other secret societies that would realize his own purposes. In March of 1812, Alexander removed Speransky from what was, in effect, a position of total power with no influence beyond the Tsar's confidence. Alexander would claim in his typical contrarian fashion that he had been robbed of his favourite minister and personal friend by the conspiracy organised by his sister, the Grand Duchess Catherine, the writer Karamazin, the friend of Shishkov, and the Rostopochin. Yet in truth, the measures uh, were taken, the, the measure was undertaken by the Tsar on his own initiative, keenly aware of Speransky's unpopularity and association with the hated French alliance, which was unravelling. The emperor's appreciation of the inevitability of war with France was epitomized by his invitation to the writer Shishkov over the patriotic colloquy of lovers of the Russian word to pen a manifesto after the dismissal of Spolansky in March of 1812 for an apolosheni, a home guard or militia in defense of Russia. <laughs> 
Let him, the enemy, meet in, in every nobleman a Pozharsky, again, relaying this back to 1812, and Pozharsky as the hero of that engagement against Poland. In every clearman a Palitzin, in every citizen a Minin, again, Kuzma Minin. Most noble estate in all ages, you have been the savior of the fatherland. Most holy synod and clergy, your voice summoned grace unto Russia's head of your heartfelt prayers, Russian people. Brave descendants of brave Slavs, you have repeatedly broken the teeth of the lions and tigers who have assailed you. Be united all who have trust in your heart and a weapon in your hands. No human force can overcome you. The success of the Russo-French alliance was indeed dependent on the strength of France in Alexander's own estimation, as this wasn't an alliance of equals, this was a relationship and indeed an alliance which on the one hand Napoleon could convince himself and dupe himself into believing was due to the particular relationship and affinity between the Tsar and the Emperor, but in reality it was a compelled alliance based on French strength at a particular moment in time, which was at the Treaty of Tilsit. And indeed, the strength of such an alliance was undermined when Napoleon would undergo a series of unforced blunders, invading Spain and opening up the prospect of a future war, the War of the Fifth Coalition, with his defeated enemy Austria. To cement the alliance, uh, Napoleon met with Alexander and Mikhail Speransky at the Congress of Erfurt, ostensibly to oppose Austria in the event of a war. However, Alexander remained effectively neutral and petitioned for the preservation of Austria after Napoleon defeated it at the Battle of Wagram. Meanwhile, Russia exploited and distracted Napoleon to engage in a war with the Ottoman Empire to annex Bessarabia from the Ottomans, and in 1809 to take Finland from the Swedes, definitively completing a series of conquests which you can argue began a hundred years earlier during the Great Northern War against Charles XII. After the defeat of Austria in the War of the Fifth Coalition, the Duchy of Warsaw, the Polish state which had been carved out of the Prussian part of Poland, was awarded territory from the Austrian part in Poland, in what was seen as a direct provocation against Russia. In other words, you have now carved Poland out of Russia. You have carved Poland out of Austria. What is to stop you carving Poland out of Russia? A possible marriage pact between Napoleon and Alexander's sister, Anna Pavlona, also fell through. In 1810, Napoleon then added insult to injury by annexing Oldenburg, which, whose uh, duke was related to Alexander through marriage, and indeed did not provide the Russians with the needed support against the Ottomans in their war, as was promised at Tilsit. Russia responded by effectively withdrawing from the continental system by 1810. To counter Russia's increasing like, isolation as a result of her detachment from both France and indeed the awkward situation France had pushed her into as an effective ally of France meant that Russia was forced to conclude pacts with her former and with her former enemies, both Sweden and the Ottomans. Sweden, if anything, was a heaven send to Russia because Napoleon committed another drastic uh, diplomatic error by seizing the Swedish controlled provinces in Mecklenburg and despite being under the control of the regent Charles Jean, Jean Bernadotte, the former Marshal of Napoleon, Sweden was able to effect a complete about turn in foreign policy to remain neutral in the war rather than join in France as part of the Grand Armée. At the same time, already aware of the inevitability of war, Alexander was putting out peace feelers to Prussia and Austria, both, again, notably, supposedly French allies, but ultimately French allies like Russia had been through force, and thereby amenable to Russia if things were to turn against Napoleon, which they would. And this is an image of the Napoleonic system and Napoleon's allies on the eve of the conflict. Nominally, Napoleon was supreme on the continent, but his authority in Spain was incredibly weak. Many of these territories which have been recently annexed to France have been done so willingly. There will be a war, a guerrilla war, in Illyria, which again, part of Croatia, which had been annexed from Austria, and Austria and their much diminished Prussia were unwilling allies. And of course, we see in the center of this, the newly created Duchy of Warsaw, the effective, what I've referred to as the sword of Damocles, aimed at all of these powers. <coughs> and you can say one of Napoleon's successes and diplomatic blunders in creating a new vassal state, which was Lord of France, whilst ensuring the diplomatic hostility of the three great powers, Austria, Prussia, and for this conversation, Russia. <laughs>
A month after the fall of Speransky, Alexander demanded the demilitarization of Poland, as Napoleon had begun a massive military build-up there and in East Prussia, notably in the cities of Warsaw, Königsberg and Danzig, with vast supplies of gunpowder, artillery, and a huge supply of food in the various supply depots and granaries for the upcoming invasion. When Napoleon crossed the Neman, ostensibly, he referred to this as a war against the various injunctions, injustices committed by Russia, not just against France after Tilsit, but against Russian intervention in Europe over the past 50 years. The express thing in terms of linking this with 1812 was with 1772, with the beginning of the partitions of Poland. And Napoleon even termed this a second Polish war. If we refer to 1806 and 1807 as the first Polish war, then the second Polish war was to award Poland even more territory at the expense of Russia. And so Napoleon's early sort of focus, strategic focus, was, was on the key city of Vilnius. Annexing Vilnius and Lithuania would have meant the restoration of a Polish-Lithuanian state. So it's not only Napoleon's immediate, you can say, um, diplomatic aspirations for the expansion of this Poland state, referring to this as the Second Polish War, but the fact that he even believed that strategically all of this could have been concluded in the boundaries of Belarus and Lithuania, if anything, demonstrates, you can say, on the one hand, Napoleon's limited aspirations, but you can say his limited appreciation of Russia and her ability to fight, the fact that he could simply enter into Russian Western territory, defeat them decisively with the Grand Armée, which amounted to some 600,000 men consisting of all of the nominal allies of Napoleon's empire, Frenchmen, Bavarians, Italians, even some Spanish, uh, Dutch contingents, and of course, unwilling Prussians and an Austrian contingent under Schwarzenberg, which was effectively neutral. In response to this, and again, indicating Alexander's own determination to fight, and that this wasn't like any of the previous coalition wars in which Napoleon had used the effective maneuverability of the French army to encircle an enemy, destroy it, move on and conclude a favorable peace treaty, Alexander declared, I will not lay down my arms while a single enemy remains on Russian soil. Indeed, the mythical element of those words was so stringent in Russian history, so striking that these were the words that Nicholas would use at the outset of um, World War I when Germany declared war on Russia. The French crossed the Neman and advanced in several columns, one towards Riga, one towards Grodno in Belarus, and one towards Vilnius, with the main thrust under Napoleon and Marshal de Vaux and Marat directed toward Vilnius and later toward Minsk. The nominally allied Austrians operated around the Ukrainian border and would effectively try and secure the French flanks as they would come under increasingly Russia, a Russian attack as Napoleon expanded his own region much further and further into Russia. Alexander was in Vilnius when the French invaded, and he quickly left overall military command to Barclay de Tolly. Barclay opted to retreat into Russia rather than face the French in battle, as Napoleon had anticipated, or indeed to surrender. Um, indeed, Barclay and the other main army, which was under Bagration, um, was supposed to be encircled and defeated in turn by Napoleon's large army. <coughs> Um, Bagration, who wanted to fight Napoleon in person, knew that the Russians were outnumbered at this time two to one, and so followed the superior commander, Barclay de Tolly, superior not in the sense of his ability, but superior in the sense that he was his literal superior, um, to begin the retreat. Napoleon achieves this great march towards Vilnius, which should be remembered only four days to reach the Neman to Vilnius, where he believes the French campaign will already effectively be over. Indeed, the French supplies of grain deposited at Danzig are only there to sustain an army of that size, 600,000 men, for around four to five weeks. Napoleon did not anticipate a long sustained conflict. He simply believed he could march into the Polish areas of the former partition, maybe win some minor territorial concessions and force Russia as a supplicant back into the continental system. If anything, this was a strategic blunt, a strategic sort of demonstration on part of Napoleon, as opposed to a willingness to fight a campaign to the death like the Russians were prepared to fight. And thus Napoleon committed the greatest of all of his military blunders, which set the seal ultimately on the legacy of the First French Empire. Despite the French advance, Napoleon failed to achieve his early objective of encircling and defeating the Russian armies of Bagration and Tatoli, respectively. 
Despite capturing various Russian supply depots, French provisions due to various freak sort of weather storms during the Russian summer meant that food took a very long time to reach the advancing armies, which not only stymied the advance, but at the same time, we see a lack of forage due to the Russian tactic of using scorched earth policy to ensure that the Russians couldn't forage as they went away. Indeed, the French Grand Armée had been used to fighting in Italy and it had been used to fighting in southern Germany. Very rich, very rich agricultural lands used to forage. And of course, now you're fighting in Russia and you're pursuing an enemy which is prepared to destroy the countryside and depopulate the region in order to defeat the enemy through attrition. And this is something that, apart from sporadic episodes in Spain, the French have not been accustomed to as of yet. By the time the French had reached Minsk, and with the minor battle of um, uh, Solonovka, which again prevented the French from dealing a decisive battle against the Russians, only six weeks into the campaign, Napoleon had already lost up to half of his fighting strength and this was due to the spread of typhus and various diseases and indeed the loss of so many horses up to a thousand horses were dying every single day through the extreme russian heat in the summer and the lack of any forage as they were passing through that territory so all of a sudden the grand armee was slogging through a hostile depopulated and devastated countryside, whilst they were already running out of provisions due to Napoleon's lack of tactical foresight. Napoleon marched towards the large city of Smolensk with its famous Kremlin on the way to Moscow, where after two months, he finally was able to pin down the army and engage in the first battle against Atoli, albeit his first great attempt to encircle the army by marching to Krasny, encircling Smolensk and defeating the armies of both Baugration and Dutoli was a remarked failure. Instead, he fights a pitch battle in Smolensk. Um, the French devastate the city of Smolensk and he is unable to deal a decisive victory. Instead, as we see with all of this, Napoleon is effectively fighting a glorified rearguard action against the retreating Russians and they retreat once more. It was at this time that de Tolly was replaced by one Mikhail Kutuzov, the man who had fought alongside Alexander at Austerlitz and had indeed been defeated, albeit Kutuzov was genuinely popular. And this was more done for political reasons, as Kutuzov was more than willing to follow de Tolly's policy of scorched earth tactics and giving way up more land, more territory, even ultimately the city of Moscow, to Napoleon. Um, and thus the retreat strategy continued, even though Bagration again wanted to fight a major battle. Um, despite this, the French continued onwards towards Moscow, despite the vast casualties and losses all along the way. And due to this political pressure, Bagration and Alexander forced Kutuzov into fighting the major battle of Borodino. Uh, what is remarkable about Borodino is that the Russians are able to launch a very effective defense against the uh, French forces. And Napoleon shows very little of his tactical brilliance. Indeed, you can say the tactical brilliance of this battle is reserved to Davout. And the greatest sort of loss really for the Russians in addition to the loss of men is the loss of, loss of uh, General Bagration, uh, who was considered one of the greatest strategic minds, especially by Napoleon. Um, nevertheless, that we're seeing huge casualties on both sides indeed you know, tens of thousands of men. The Battle of Borodino had no original sort of strategic flair. It was simply a bludgeoning match, a, a, a vast sort of protracted melee between these two sides with Napoleon um, initiating these very unimaginative attacks, which rely simply on the superiority of the French army rather than the superiority of tactics. And in this case, after losing tens of thousands of men in what was the bloodiest day of the Napoleonic campaigns, Napoleon was unable to achieve the aim which, again, he desperately needed, which was the destruction of the Russian army. Instead, not only did Kutuzov abdicate that responsibility of um, holding on to Moscow, he was prepared to sacrifice Moscow and preserve the remnants of the army. And this leads to, you can say, the mystical element of the transformation of this conflict into again, uh, you can say a, a baptism of fire of Russia's history going forward. Uh, at this time, uh, Rostopochin is the now, after this long protracted period of time, he's a figure who constantly pops up. Uh, the conservative Rostopochin is the governor general of Moscow, and he orders that the city be burned and 
the population of Moscow leave rather than give Napoleon effectively a friendly city where he can be received. So the army has retreated and the vast segment of the population has gone and fires are already starting as the French begin to approach the capital. Indeed, it should be noted that Moscow is not the capital per se of Russia, it is the spiritual capital. It is the first of Russia's cities, but the court city is at St. Petersburg. You can say St. Petersburg is the capital of the Romanov Empire, but Moscow is the capital of Russia, in the sense it is the grandest of all the Russian cities, and it is indeed the seat of the Third Rome. So the loss psychologically of Moscow is severe, but again, it indicates the tenacity of the Russians and their desire to fight a total war against Napoleon, which Napoleon again hadn't anticipated, especially when we see his various um, entries into both Berlin and into Vienna, where he is repeatedly offered accolades and given the key to the city. Um, any, sort of any sort of welcoming party that Napoleon meets in Moscow is invariably a group of collaborators and indeed anyone who was subsequently seen as and to have not left the city and to have remained in Moscow was viewed later as a collaborator. When Napoleon entered the Kremlin, Napoleon basically believed he had won the conflict. I'm not sure sort of exactly what military metric he believed he had won the conflict, but he presents his peace treaty to the Tsar several times throughout the course of September and October and is rebuffed. It should also be noted in terms of the, you could say the um, developments of Russian history, that it was exactly 200 years before that Pozharsky and Kumin had evicted the Polish garrison from, um, from Moscow in 1612. So exactly 200 years later, Napoleon, arguably representing a worse threat to the Russians than the Polish and Lithuanian ever did, um, has taken Moscow again. Um, in terms of explaining the Moscow and the Petrograd thing, um, I do not understand why Moscow is so loved. Well, Moscow is the, is the capital city of Russia in terms of the, the Russia state that emerged out of the Mongol conquest. Um, Moscovy was essentially the phoenix that arose on the ashes of all of Russia's great cities and eclipsed the other ancient cities, Novgorod, Kiev, and indeed the closer capital and proximity of Vladimir Suzdal. Thereby, it was the seat of the Danilovich dynasty, which gave Russia's first dynasty of Tsars after Ivan the Terrible, and thus afterwards Muscovite became almost synonymous with Russian. And after the annexations and partitions of Poland, Russia almost simply became Russia because most of the Russias, with the exception of a small part of Austria, have been united under the Russian state. So Moscow is the beginning of the second Russia the state that emerged out of the key destruction of the Kievan Rus. That's why it's so sacred. It was the seat of the patriarchal seat, um, which again shows some sort of indication that Russia was a spiritual and holy city. We have the connection with the Third Rome, which goes back to the 15th century. Um, but even though, you know, by this time Russia had lost its patriarchal seat, um, Peter the Great had abolished it in the 1710s during his church reforms. Nevertheless, Moscow still held this spiritual significance. And of course, it was the site of the uh, Cathedral of the Annunciation, which was in the Kremlin, which was the coronation cathedral of the Russian Tsars. So in many ways, it was also <coughs> the Rems and the Paris of Russian civilization. And St. Petersburg was just the project of one eccentric westernizing Tsar, Peter the Great and since then has represented, you can say, the duality and the dichotomy between Russia's potential identities. Anyway, back onto whatever I was talking about. Um, Napoleon would remain in Moscow for one month, and he's often criticized during this time also for having stayed too long. Indeed, he stays until Kutuzov is able to levy enough troops in Russia, where for the first time the Russian formal army, not just the Cossacks or the raiding parties, which are chipping away at the Russians, at the French supplies which are coming in from the empire and reinforcing the remnant of the army in Moscow in October, and of course the reinforcements and the, um, the flanking forces um, throughout Belarus, Lithuania, Vitebsk, Smolensk, all of these various cities. Um, the Russians are actually now outnumbering the French for the first time. And Kutuzov really takes the first move, which forces Napoleon uh, to begin his retreat, understanding that Alexander is not playing by the rule book as he anticipated. And 
Kutuzov first defeats Murat, and Napoleon tries to defeat, I believe it's from the city of, uh, uh, tries to retreat southwards in order to link up to the city of Smolensk, which was serve as his winter quarters, after which Napoleon could launch another potential campaign against Russia in the spring of 1813. Instead, Kutuzov is able to win the Battle of um, Malioslavets. And what is remarkable for Napoleon, having spent his time trying to find a chance of a decisive victory, Napoleon's confidence leaves him in October of 1812 because he's now confronted with a larger Russian army and he doesn't believe that the Russians can actually be defeated at a second battle of Malio Savitz. So instead, Napoleon continues with the retreat and he retreats through the devastating depopulated territory upon which he'd marched all the way to Moscow including marching through the um, ruins of the Battle of Borodino <coughs> and the fact that these tens of thousands of corpses which had been felled that day hadn't been cleared up or any sort of measure taken to deal with the body since then, apart from uh, people looting the corpses for all various valuables. And indeed, in addition to all of that, the Russian, fo uh, the, the forces which left Moscow, the French forces were laden down with uh, the loot of the city of Moscow as well. So that also slowed their campaign. And during this time, we see the Russians effectively chipping away at the um, the various flanking forces which are guarding the French retreat. On all ends, the Russians are beginning to encircle what is left of the French army. The French are able to retreat up until Smolensk, and then Kutuzov is able to engage them again. And this is where we enter by November of 18, um, 1812, where the Russian winter really begins to set in. We're talking about a critical phase of the Grand Army. The Grand Army entered with some <coughs> 600,000 men, and now we're just talking about Napoleon's core army of 120,000 men, which are trying to escape with their lives. Um, at, the, at the moment, the Russians have unexpectedly been able to defeat uh, uh, Saint-Cyr and the, I believe, the force of Vitebsk, and the Russians are now looking as if they can trap Napoleon on the side, on the wrong side of the uh, river Belagina and possibly uh, capture not just the Russian, the entire French army, but also Napoleon. Um, and the remarkable thing at Berezina is that Napoleon is able to effectively force various regiments, such as, you know, the Young Guard, to hold the retreat against the Russian forces, basically committing suicide. The French engineers to go into the river Berezina and commit suicide, building these river, building these bridges in what was effectively uh, waters which would instantly, <laughs> if you went into these waters and a couple of hours later you would be dead. There was no way of surviving this. Napoleon's whole strategy relied on the rivers freezing over, but instead you just have this slush which the French engineers had to march um, had to march through to build these bridges to save the remnants of the army, whilst Davu and his um, uh, rear guard is fighting a desperate campaign to reach up with the forces of Napoleon. He starts off with 6,000 men, I believe, after the departure of Smolensk. He's trapped behind Kutuzov's army and ends up saving only 700 men. Um, so the French are now entering a desperate situation. And they only, through luck, are able to cross over to Belagina and finally reach Vilnius, um, where around 20,000 men exist. And it's on December the 5th, 1812, that Napoleon abandons the remnants of his army and goes to Paris to, ostensibly because of the threats of a coup, but to reorganize the levies for his future campaigns in Germany. Um, so when we talk about the final sort of remnants of the army crossing over into East Prussia, in, in, to Königsberg and Niemann, I believe it was Marshal Ney himself, who was the final man, the last man of the rear guard, 20,000 men crossed over. Um, of the thousands of men, it should be noted that many of them, in, indeed Portuguese and Spanish fighters who had effectively been conscripted uh, against their will into the French army, many of them deserted. And of the vast number of people who died in the campaign, uh, roughly 60% 60, 60 of the casualties, if not more, were casualties due to uh, famine and disease. Very few people actually died as a result of uh, military casualties. Others died, for, say, for example, of neglect in prison after being taken as prisoners of war. Uh, but the effect on Russia was just as severe. Despite the fact that the Russians were routinely outnumbered, they were able to gain levies at a rate of which Napoleon was not, obviously fighting deep in um, 
enemy territory. So towards the end, we see Russian casualties of around 300,000, um, if not more. And again, um, most of them dying due to disease and having to fight in the horrific temperatures around November and December of 1812. And that also explains, you can say, why Kutuzov um, wasn't so anxious to be so aggressive and decisive against Napoleon, why he was so willing to use attrition to um, defeat the remnants of the French army, rather than in the process of destroying the French army in its entirety, uh, killing off more men than he had the possibility of losing, because Kutuzov was now thinking not just about 1812, he was thinking about the campaigning season in 1813, because Tsar Alexander had no intention of making peace now. He only had the intention of crossing over into Europe. And at Tarogan, we see the defection of a large Prussian army to the Russians. And it's here, really, a few months later, this will be consolidated, where the Prussians begin their defection towards Russia. And the War of the Sixth Coalition um, begins in earnest. They will be joined by Sweden. And in the first few months, the spring of 1813, the various levies of the French army are redrafted. And Napoleon is able to achieve the remarkable in the fact that despite these horrific losses, um, the core of the Grand Armée is able to provide a veteran corps to train up a new army um, of new raw levies, you know, 17, 18 year olds in Paris uh, in, throughout the rest of France, uh, many of whom are resisting the levy, others who are going willingly into Napoleon's last great campaign in Germany of 1813. And there he's able to stymie the Prusso-Russian advance at uh, Lutzen and Bautzen. Um, he's trying to consolidate his forces throughout the summer through um, a protracted truce, but the Tsar is able to win a, another diplomatic feat by bringing over the Austrians into the conflict as well. And by 1813, the French situation in Spain is also, it was not just tenuous, it's dire. Um, the British under Wellington, combined with the Portuguese and Spanish, were able to inflict inc um, severe losses on the French forces who ultimately come command to the command of Marshal Soult. Uh, Napoleon wins a great victory at the Battle of Dresden, which is very swiftly undone by the machinations of uh, uh, von Blücher, the Prussian commander. And at Leipzig, the forces of Austria, Prussia, Russia, Sweden, and the various German allies, which had once been on Napoleon's side, but now with the exception of Saxony, had more or less defected towards the um, coalition side, defeated Napoleon decisively. And he was able to escape with a part of his army back to France, where he conducted a desperate defense of France throughout the winter and the spring of 1814, before the Tsar himself, Alexander, led the offensive against Paris itself. And unlike what we see in Moscow, there were ideas that the Tsar would do to Paris what had been done to Moscow. Instead, the Tsar enters into Paris and is treated as a liberator which is all the more remarkable given Napoleon's complete collapse of popularity. Napoleon becomes synonymous with the continuation of a pointless war, which France could not possibly win. And the Tsar becomes synonymous with peace. And it's at this point where Talleyrand has offered the keys to the city to Tsar Alexander that Napoleon wants to attack Paris and his marshals turn against him and effectively order him to capitulate and accept exile in Elba. At this point, Tsar Alexander is hailed throughout Europe as a liberator, and he becomes the <coughs> linchpin of the new European political system, the Holy Alliance, and later the Quadruple Alliance when France intervenes in the system. But what is more remarkable is that at this point, even after all of this, even after you can say the religiously transfigurative episode of the burning of Moscow, Alexander still is under the is under the um, influence of some of his liberal pre predispositions. Um, he would later appoint one liberal Greek nationalist, uh, Cappadocius, to be his foreign minister, and De La Harpe will come back and enter into a, um, a prominent position of influence, the former courtier. So this, I mean, uh, but it should be noted that whilst all of this is happening, 
the Tsar is undergoing a genuine religious conversion. There'd already been elements of a religious conversion in 1806, elements of religious conversion again in, 18, in 1812, when the Tsar is appealing to holy Orthodox Russia, the sacred territory, and of course, holy Moscow and its defense. Um, nevertheless, it's not orthodoxy which really appeals to the Tsar. Instead, it's pietist Lutheranism. So when he goes to Europe, where he is traveling through Germany during the campaign of 1813, um, and he arrives, I believe it's in Switzerland, I think, yes, in Basel. Um, he meets one Baroness de Kludner, who is a Lutheran evangelist, who comes to have a profound influence on his own sense of Christianity. And she is helped by one um, Henry Louis um, Empaitas, again, a I believe a Calvinist from Geneva, who again tries to influence the new conversion of Alexander, again trying to enumerate these various contradictions. And Alexander becomes the issue at the Congress of Vienna, which reformulates the new European order. He is the radical, he is the revolutionary. Prussia falls back on its rather ancient sort of territorial desires, wanting to annex Saxony and wanting territory out of Poland. But the Tsar wants all of Poland as recompense uh, for what had been dealt to Russia. And at this point, the Metternich in particular, I've already um, mentioned the fact that Metternich believed that the Tsar was a madman. Metternich opposes Alexander readily and believes that Alexander still has an impression of Jacobinism, which could make him a opponent to the creation of a new peaceful order in all of Europe by appealing to, you can say, old fashioned notions of Russian expansionism. And the interesting thing is that Metternich is correct. It will be Russia that will undermine, and you can argue along with Britain, destroy the concept of Europe system that's created out of it. Albeit at this moment, Metternich doesn't understand under what ideology Russia will march and it seems that already at this point, you know, Alexander is talking about liberalism, he's talking about the rights of man, he's talking about constitutions, he's wanting to give Poland his new territory, the remnants of which, which he's actually given Congress Poland, a new liberal monarchical constitutional system more similar to that of Britain <coughs> than that of Russia. Uh, which is all the more remarkable. And you can say that the Russian hostility um, and the grandiose expectations of Russia during the, con during the Congress of Vienna actually help rehabilitate France back into the political system. Um, Talleyrand in France, Talleyrand is able to demonstrate, especially to Metternich, who had already believed this, that France was essential as part of the Cotri Pool Alliance in checking Russian expansionism into the rest of Europe. And consequently, Alexander is denied most of the aims that he wants. <coughs> Two in particular. One is the conquest of all of Poland, but the other is that he has to acquiesce to the uh, endurance of the Ottoman Empire as part of the old established order. Um, which Metternich wants to uphold. And this, I mean, on the one hand, you can say Alexander is the most genuinely religious of all the members of the Holy Alliance. He believes that this is a genuinely Christian alliance, so much so that his own um, religious experience crosses over denominational lines to embrace an ecumenism, which is very strange at that time, um, especially from an Orthodox Tsar. Um, and this Christian zeal appeals to the idea that the Tsar is the protector of the Greeks, he's the protector of the Orthodox community in the Balkans, and Metternich very much opposes this idea. Indeed, the Tsar is very much committed to these ideas, and you can say the last sort of gasp of the Tsar's liberalism is his desire to create his own little utopian societies in Russia called the military settlements. After uh, Shuisky and Spolansky have all been dismissed, interestingly enough, Speransky will undergo his own, um, <coughs> what you can argue, rehabilitation later on. Uh, the conservative Count um, Arekchev, one of the um, great figures behind Emperor Paul, is placed in charge of creating new military settlements, um, effectively ways where you, you can create reserve units throughout all of the Russian Empire. And these were mainly designed to be in Ukraine for usage against <coughs> <clears throat> a potential war in the Ottoman Empire. And 
the most remarkable about these things is that they were supposed to be genuinely utopian. I mean, these were military societies. They weren't just military settlements. Indeed, once you reach the age of seven, um, a child was effectively taken away from their parents and placed under the control of their regiment, which they would remain adopting full military service at the age of 18 until the age of 45, where they were still expected to live on these um, military settlements and to serve in hospitals there. And indeed, you can say that the military settlements demonstrate the worst aspects of um, Alexander's own sort of psychology in terms of his outward perceptions. Everything had to be so. All the designs were symmetrical. All the buildings had to be of the same same structure, the same design. And the conditions in these utopian little military statelets were so severe, even though they would last after his reign, um, that often you have disease outbreaks and you have horrific court martials and um, mutinies and various um, uh, people being killed effectively. So um, these didn't work out very well, but nevertheless, they do demonstrate, you say, the last elements of utopianism and liberalism in Alexander's own thought, and it, the, indeed his idea of separating children to become part of these um, communal military societies. Um, the real thing, I believe, that changes Alexander's own view is the influence of Metternich personally. Alexander becomes an active proponent of the concept of Europe system. He believes that he is essential to upholding this new order created from the Congress of Vienna, despite the upset in 1814 and 1815. And on the way to the conference at um, uh, the Congress of A. La Chapelle, uh, Aachen, um, he is nearly captured by a group of um, radical liberals. And it's really here that the Tsar begins to understand the potential revolutionary implications of these groups, who, despite all the Tsar's appeals and affectations to liberalism, are still prepared to target and attempt to overthrow the Tsar. Indeed, there are various societies of officers groups, um, the Northern Society, which wants a constitutional reform of the Russian monarchy, and the Southern Society, which wants to depose the Romanov dynasty and create a republic. Not only depose the Romanov dynasty, but go throughout Europe with its various members and execute every last Romanov so that no one can claim the throne of Russia again. But again, the conservative turn seems to be based out of his own necessity and the influence of Metternich, which only went so far because Metternich and the Tsar are actively talking to one another, thereby Metternich can exert, the, you can say, the strength of his personality over the, um, you can say, increasingly passive and almost schizophrenic um, um, personality of um, Alexander throughout this time. Not only does Alexander undergo a more conservative turn, you can say the last elements of the liberalism that sort of personify him really shine through are in his opposition to the Carlsbad decrees of 1819, which imposed strict censorship throughout the German Confederation. The Tsar instead turns to the possibility of abdication and living in Tagenrog, which is near modern day Rostov um, in the Sea of Azov. Um, despite still being Tsar. And this leads to one of the most unusual situations in Russian history where there are rumors that he doesn't die, that he becomes a monk, goes to live in Siberia and adopts the pseudonym Kuzmich. And he dies in the 1860s, um, even though it was very unlikely it would happen as an interesting story, nevertheless. But nevertheless, he goes to Taganrog with his wife and dies there in 1825. And both Constantine and Nicholas, his brothers, because the Tsar has no, has no male heir, um, believe that the other is due to inherit. Indeed, Alexander had made a secret will in 1823, whereby Nicholas was made Tsar without his knowledge and Constantine had repudiated the throne. So Nicholas be believed that when his brother's death was announced, that his older brother Constantine would become Tsar. Constantine was in Poland and it took several weeks for the message to come through that Nicholas was in fact not um, Nicholas was in fact the Tsar and Constantine had renounced his um, claim on the throne. So for a few weeks in late 1825, Russia was technically without a Tsar. And it was this moment that a group of various revolutionaries radicalized by the French Revolution and their passage through, and you can say um, affinity and uh, collaboration, fraternization uh, with the Bonapartists in 1814, 
had radicalized them into these secret societies, these reformer societies, and they march in St. Petersburg and attempt to depose Nicholas. And um, they even kill a, a general, um, Maridorovich, um, who had been a key general during the campaign of 1812, uh, when he is sent to parley on behalf of the Tsar. So instead, the Tsar, confronted with these Decemberists, uh, crushes the rebellion um, by eff effectively firing at them with artillery, using the support of loyalist soldiers. And afterwards, it will be one, interestingly enough, Spolansky, who is placed at the, as a special counsel to oversee the um, judgments on these various uh, would-be revolutionaries against the new Tsar Nicholas. So in many ways, this represents the bookend of this period and Russia's brief flirtation with liberalism, radicalism, and indeed the attempted coup during the brief interregnum following the death of the strange reign of Alexander in the form of the Decemberists, indeed going back to war and peace. Um, there is an allusion in the final book of War and Peace about Pierre going off to become a Decemberist, again, <laughs> emblematic of the schizophrenia of the Russian political scene during this time. And Tolstoy planned to write a sequel to War and Peace called The Decemberists. Um, but The Decemberists, again, is a false start, but it's a revolutionary demonstration which will obviously become very important as a forerunner for Russia's future flirtation with revolutions. Um, but nevertheless, 1825 is really the year where we see the the most confident of Russia's reactionary and conservative czars, Nicholas I, assume control of the government. And you can say the most serious attempt to steer Russia deliberately away from the course of um, pseudo-liberalism, which had characterized the reign of Alexander, and the oddity that is the reign of Paul, who definitely doesn't fall into any of these categorizations which we mentioned today. So, thankfully, my voice is held together. <coughs> I'm sorry about my cough, and I've been able to get through this lecture and deliver it. Um, all I can say is, I, I can see some people have sent super chats. What I'm going to try and do, um, for all f future things, just for reference, is read the super chats in the um, discussion segments of these conversations, so you know other people can um, chime in. It's not just me uh, only responding to um, to your comments and suggestions. So I will answer your super chats in the discussion, which is going to take place on Monday. So. Thank you, everyone, very much for listening and for tuning in. Um, do join the channel if you want access to all of the content on the channel. Uh, if you go for Pleb or Equestrian tier, you gain access to the vast majority of content, but Patrician tier to gain access to absolutely everything. In addition to the discussion part of this conversation on Monday, uh, there will also be um, a Return of the Lord of the Rings series uh, next Saturday. Uh, briefly, we'll cover a couple of episodes on the second age, hopefully before Amazon brings out its uh, new series. Anyway, thank you again, everyone, for listening. Uh, like the video if you enjoyed it, comment, and possibly consider subscribing. Uh, join the channel, join the Discord. Thank you very much, and goodbye.